Uh, So Revelation 22, verses 1 through 2. Uh, The text reads this way. Um, Are we all there? Yes, sir. All right. It reads, Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as a crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street, and on each side of the river grew a tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. And then verse 2 ends, the leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. Let me read it from the New International Version. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the capacity to connect with you through song, through the preached word. God, we ask that you would simply have your way in the matchless, still mighty, still available, still present name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Y'all, we're still moving through our medicine, melanin, and mental health series. Uh, And for this evening, uh, I'm going to preach from this theme, uh, Take the Long View. Can y'all say it with me? Take the Long View. God will bring it together after a while. God will bring it together after a while. So COVID-19 has scrambled our ordinary sense of time and routine. This week, for instance, hasn't been a usual succession of seven days. For for many of us, this week has been one unending day with a few naps in between. Uh, This week hasn't been a linear journey from Monday to Friday, but instead, this week has mixed up our historical consciousness. Historical consciousness is the ability to live in the present, to live in today with the sense of the past, and with the sense of the future. When, when COVID-19 came like it came last week, the days just start running into each other. And Monday feels like Wednesday. Wednesday feels like Tuesday. Tuesday feels like Friday. It's one long, unasked for, unwanted, unpleasant day that keeps rolling along. And the 24-hour cycle seems to stretch without permission, stretch Without our consent, COVID-19 has scrambled our historical consciousness. And if COVID-19 is unlike previous epidemics, and if it's also expected to last for nobody knows exactly how long, uh, it's a problem for our historical consciousness. Stay with me this evening. COVID-19 has squeezed our calendars into unusable shape, collapsing our sense of the past and the future into a confusing, bewildering, and unasked for a present moment. Uh, Let me see if I can say it this way. As that Bronx-born bard told us, coronavirus, coronavirus. Y'all know who I'm talking about. She told us that it's getting real. Uh, uh, Without historical consciousness, I'm talking about Sister Cardi B from the Bronx. Y'all not with me this evening. Uh, Coronavirus not only challenges our public health, Uh, But it challenges our historical consciousness. If we don't have a sense of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, it's hard for us to have hope. If it seems like we're going to be in this forever and a day, uh, it's hard for us to have hope. It's hard for us to have a sense of expectation. It's hard for us to have a sense of better days lie ahead. It's hard for us to say trouble don't last always and mean it if our historical consciousness is scrambled and we look to the past and don't find any lessons and we look to the future and uh, the usual and the ordinary keeps getting postponed. It's hard to have hope. And without hope, are you with me? We cannot experience the wellness that God intends for us. And so repeatedly, governors and public health officials declare, we haven't seen a moment like this. Have y'all heard that? Uh, We haven't seen a moment like this. Coronavirus is uncharted territory. And what that means is that previous epidemics are not a totally reliable guide for what we're currently undergoing. What's meant when governors and mayors and public health officials say that we haven't quite encountered something like this before, it means that looking back, 
at yesterday's ills doesn't give us a perfect blueprint for what we deal with today's crisis. That's a problem for our historical consciousness. And so looking back isn't only a challenge. We also can't quite look forward to predict when COVID-19 will be done. I know I'm not the only one in the room. I know I'm not the only one connecting virtually who is looking for the day to be hastened when coronavirus is a thing of the past. How long will the stay in place orders last in California, in New York, and in New Jersey? How long until the curve flattens? How long until uh, the next case of getting coronavirus goes down? How long until there are no more cases and no more anguished prayers that we're crying out on behalf of our elders? How long until this mess is a thing that's in the dustbin of history? How long will we have to deal with this crisis that we didn't ask for and yet we can't seemingly extricate ourselves away from? How long will this sickness that's running across the land be with us. It's a problem for our historical consciousness, not only looking backwards, but also looking forwards to an uncertain future. Some predict that this will be over in late spring. Some folks say uh, it'll be over in the summer. Some folks say it might be over in fall. Some folks say it might be over in winter. Uh, we, we've heard a bunch of conflicting and competing predictions, yes? Uh, uh, and so a lot of timelines are floating around. And while we appreciate uh, the commitment to accuracy and precision by public health professionals, amen, we, we want folks to give us reliable information. We want to be able to take it and, and run to the bank. Uh, but even though it makes sense from a public health perspective, uh, it doesn't necessarily give us all of the peace that we need. It doesn't give us all of the joy and the calm and the, the sense that uh, everything will, will take care of itself after a while that we really want. And so where we find ourselves in this moment is snatched between a yesterday with few lessons and a tomorrow with no definite idea of when ordinary days and when the usual and the regular, which we so desperately want, will return to be our state of affairs. We're uncertain about the past and unsure about the future, which raises the question, if we're not clear about the past and if we're not certain about the future, are we also unclear about our God? If, if, we, if, we, if our historical consciousness is eroding and we lose hope, and if we, we find our hope with this back against the wall, it, it ultimately raises questions about the competency of God. Are y'all with me this evening? If we're uncertain about the past, I'm going to say it until uh, I sense consensus about the predicament that we face. If we're unclear about how the past can help us, if we're uncertain of when this uh, catastrophe will be beyond us, it makes us unclear about our God. And lack of clarity about the past combined with lack of confidence in the future has a way of pronouncing last rites and doing a funeral on our hope and without hope beloved. We cannot be well. And so my question this evening as we are virtually communing in God's presence, my question this evening as uh, it's the music ministry and all of us here together is, where is this thing headed? Is that your question this evening? Duly trained experts anticipate not only a pandemic, uh, but they're saying that we might be teetering and tilting on the brink of a recession. Where is this situation headed? Where's the next stop on this train? It's a question that we have to raise. It's a question that needs answering. And I hope y'all don't mind if I invite a guest to join us for the conversation this evening. Is that all right? I, I can't hear you in the comment box, but I, I hope y'all don't mind if I invite a visionary from the Isle of Patmos to join us this evening. We, we read in a text that there was a visionary who was enduring imposed social distancing. And even though he experienced involuntary social distancing from the Roman Empire, God was still speaking. Yeah. And God gave the visionary called John a glimpse into what God's good tomorrow might hold. And I sense that John has a word for where this whole thing is heading. John has 
some theological insight on what God is up to. John is a first century visionary bringing a 21st century message to this coronavirus age. Am I talking to somebody? John is a visionary who, as the old preachers used to say, peered beyond the curtain of eternity to bring a word into our troubled history. John speaks to us stuck between an uncertain, frustrating history and an uncertain future. Are y'all walking with me this evening? John speaks to us when we're stuck between the PTO balance was low and I'm not sure what the PTO balance will be when I return. John speaks to us when we're stuck between childcare was tough pre-crisis and now I have to adjust to having the little ones at home. John speaks to us stuck between a federal administration of questionable pre-crisis performance and absolutely terrible in-crisis performance. God speaks to us stuck between, I know that God has shown up in the past and when I look at right now and what lies further, I'm not quite sure what God is up to. John has a word for those of us who are sandwiched and squeezed between a history that we have questions about and a future that we also have questions about. And so what John's word to us, if I had to give it to you in a sentence, is take the long view. God's going to bring it all together after a while. John's word to us is that God will work it out after a while. John's word to us is that God has the capacity, God has the creativity to curb this crisis. John is asking us to refresh our timeline. He's asking us to look beyond what we see right now. John is asking us to understand this moment as an opportunity to reunite with loved ones to reunite with long forgotten dreams, to reunite with our culture through Instagram live parties, which trend on Twitter where the founder of Facebook stops by and Oprah stops by and Kamala Harris stops by. Y'all weren't dancing with DJ, y'all were dancing with DJ Nice last night? Y'all, y'all leaving me alone. I cut my two-step and I, I did a little bit of the mop. Y'all can't see me do my mop, but I, I was enjoying myself because God has a way of using dance to bring healing and serenity and a relief from all of the stress that we're experiencing. God, beloved, is going to bring it all together after a while. It might not look like it at the moment. But God is going to bring it all together after a while. Can we dive further in our text? The Bible tells us in Revelation about a river. Uh, And for those of you in the New York area, it's not the Hudson River or the East River. Uh, It's a clean river, bless the Lord. Uh, It's a river made of crystal, a river whose streams are not merely filled with beautiful water, but a river whose streams are filled with life itself. And beside that river stands a tree, a tree nurtured by a river of life, a tree whose leaves are poised and positioned to bring healing to the nations. God's tree is not just for one person who's putting together an individual plant-based diet. God's tree is not just for one household, but in your Bible. And in my Bible, God's tree is outstretched for the healing of the nations. Revelation 22 points to an inclusive vision of healing. And as the elders of the church used to remind us, everybody has a right to the tree of life. Amen. Everybody has a right to uh, enjoy wellness, to enjoy health, to uh, enjoy uh, an end to uh, whatever sickness they may be enduring. And at a time when tests and hospital beds aren't terribly easy to find, it's comforting to know that no one is excluded from God's vision of life-giving water and a healing tree. At a time when universal health care enjoys popular support but is too expensive for those who need it most, which is a most ungodly condition for a society to be in. At a time when folk need to see their doctor and can't, not because they don't want to, but because it's too costly. What we see in the vision that John gives us is that God's vision is for a tree of life that doesn't require a premium and a copay. 
God's vision of healing is accessible with ha without having to, to prove your worth or show your pay stub. God's vision of healing is accessible to us without having to prove that we're worthy because God always, already, and never not sees us as worthy. In God's vision, all of us have a right to the tree of life. One theologian makes a, a distinction between uh, technical knowledge and ontological reason. Uh, from a technical perspective, her point is simply, uh, in this context, that we ought to trust folk who have uh, the expertise and who have the knowledge to tell us what medical guidelines we should be following. We ought to trust folk who tell us, when you wash your hands, don't wash it for 10 seconds. You ought to wash your hands for 20 seconds. When, when we listen to, to public health professionals, we, we ought to trust folk who tell us that social distancing is not you stand a couple of strides away from folk, but, you know, you get your six feet away from each other. We ought to trust folk who have uh, the, the, the training and the, the specialized set of knowledge to help us make it through this thing. Uh, but, but, but Daly argues that in addition to technical knowledge, in addition to uh, specialized understanding, are y'all with me? Uh, she argues that we also need to have ontological reason. What is that? Ontological reason refers to our intuition. It refers to uh, that, that sense of, of, of understanding that comes from the gut, that comes from when you're in your prayer closet. Ontological reason is the space where the living God can command complete attention with nothing but a whisper. Ontological reasoning is where uh, one psalmist says, deep calls out to deep. I don't have all the words for it. I just know that when God shows up, my attention is completely yielded to the eternal and the divine. Daily is arguing for us to, 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 to incline our ear towards public health professionals, but to lean absolutely uh, only upon God. We, 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 we ought to not oppose one to the other. We need technical knowledge, but if we're going to follow the advice and not blow our minds due to the stress of this moment, we have to lean on something other than what the governor says, other than what the mayor says, other than what uh, a public health professional says. We value them. We appreciate their expertise. We have, in fact, been preaching about medicine and mental health all month long. But to make it through this moment, we're going to have to get a prayer through. To make it through this moment, to find out where we're going in this time, we've got to lean on the living God. And so the text tells us that God has a river of life. It tells us that beside that river is a tree which is not meant to be raw material for paper, benches, and doors, but instead it's a tree that's planted in the middle of God's city for the healing of the nations. And I'm wondering if on this evening where we're in the second week of a time that feels strange and weird and unfamiliar, even in this time where the tyranny of the present is dominating our attention so much so that it's hard to think a month ahead. In this time where our historical consciousness is scrambled and our hope is scrambled, can we take the long view of faith together? God wants us to keep our eyes on what uh, those who have specialized knowledge come to say. But God is also saying, don't forget that ontological reason gives us a different clock. Don't forget to not only read the newspaper, but to also say with the steadfast faith of our Christian ancestors that trouble doesn't last always. Ontological reason can follow the stay-at-home orders and still believe in down-home prayers and home-cooked meals where you commit it all to God before you do what you have to do. God is asking us in this moment to trust that powers and principalities which seem to be dominant now in the form of COVID-19 won't always reign. God is asking us to take caution and take courage at the same time. Grieve as you need to, cry as you need to, but don't forget your hope in God. The Bible tells us that the seed is already planted and the soil is already being tilled for a tree that can heal the nations. What is the tree? The tree symbolizes God's labor to birth wellness in a hurting 
and frightened world. The tree symbolizes God's intention and God's capacity to bring a sense of we can make it through this. When it feels like the pain and the despair and the isolation of this moment will be eternal and not have an expiration date. God still has a tree. And even though we can't uh, count on business as normal anywhere, we can still count on God to answer our prayers. We can still count on God to uh, respond to and to do uh, the work of miracles. And so what I'm simply saying is that we ought to build our hope on things eternal. Uh, we ought to still trust in God's unchanging and healing hand. John uh, is coming to us this evening to invite us to take the long view. And just like trees don't, uh, just like fruit doesn't emerge on trees overnight but still comes, God's healing is on the way. And while we're taking the long view of God's healing, I want us to also notice that wellness and growth often happen beneath the surface. Wellness and growth often happen beneath the surface. If we consider the image of our text, there's a tree which is planted by the river. And the tree which is planted by the river uh, has roots uh, which connect to a source which give it the nutrients and uh, the sustaining power that it needs in order to have the leaves which stretch for the healing of the nations to happen in the first place. And so we can't directly observe roots growing in the soil, but we know that development is happening because we can see it when the leaves begin to expand. A tree that's planted by the right water can endure even when casual observation and staring at the tree suggests that growth is canceled or postponed and just like the roots of a tree, God is causing growth to emerge beneath the surface. When our community gathers together virtually, God is causing growth to emerge beneath the surface and God is bringing healing through connection that happens on the group chat. God is bringing healing when we link up with one another through Marco Polo. God is bringing healing when we are all of a sudden our calendars are not as busy as they used to be and we have enough time to check in on our strong friend and check in on those who may be a little more vulnerable. God is somehow sparking and spurring wellness and growth beneath the surface and what if we've grown more than we've dared to notice? What if just like a tree that could misjudge its growth because the roots are after all beneath the surface? What if God is stretching and expanding our faith in ways that we don't even give ourselves credit for? What if God is helping us to mature and to walk more tall in courage and to be bigger than we thought we might have been, even in the midst of this kind of moment. Could it be that despite our anxiety, despite our valid concerns, despite it all, that God is building us up, fortifying us, strengthening us? If, let me put it in a different uh, uh, light, if a Brooklyn tree can grow through the sidewalk and, 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 and break up the concrete such that uh, the, the tree can have a little leaning ministry. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, if you're from Brooklyn, if you're from the Bronx, for whatever reason, the, the, the trees don't break up like that in certain parts of Manhattan, but that's another sermon for another day. If a Brooklyn tree can bust through the sidewalk with nothing but sporadic rain and a busted fire hydrant that sometimes gives it a little water in the summer, if God can cause a tree to grow under those circumstances, imagine what God can do with the tree that's planted by the river of life. Even if trees are socially distant from one another, as long as they're connected to the source, they can survive. Even if trees are far removed from one another, as long as they have a connection point with living water, they can make it through circumstances they might not be able to comprehend. If we're connected to the source, we have the capacity to grow and to push through and to move through. And what I want to suggest is that the church is a forest of trees distributed across creation, across the country, across this city. And while we're apart from one another physically, if we just peek beneath the surface, 
Our roots are connected. And we share a common source called the river of life. And the church is in many respects trees planted for the healing of the nations. Let me see if I can say it another way. It's a difficult moment to spend all this time by ourselves for some of us. Uh, because for some of us, aloneness is more fear-inducing than company. It's a difficult thing to be alone and to have aloneness not result in fear, but aloneness to turn you to solitude, to turn you to being at peace and at ease with yourself. And a part of what I love is that the tree suggests to us that even if, uh, because it's not uh, a great many trees that we see in the text, but even if we're by ourselves seemingly, as long as we're connected to God, our roots can find other folks who are in the struggle with us, other folks who are in the soil with us, other folks who are down and dirty and in the mud and the muck and the mire of life, even though uh, above the surface, yeah, 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 even though above the surface we may not be uh, uh, linked with one another beneath the surface, we're all going through the same challenges and we're also connected to a God who's using those challenges as fertilizer to grow us, to stretch us to deepen us and to develop us. God's long reign plan of healing is not only uh, working beneath the surface for our personal wellness, but uh, that plan of wellness that God is up to has uh, a bit of healing for the nations. That, that plan of long range healing that God is doing is powerful because uh, the truth is that independently God can work healing. God doesn't necessarily need us in order to extend God's arm and to heal somebody. Am I talking straightforwardly? Uh, but I believe that God commands the church to participate in the healing of the nations. We're called to ensure that everybody can access the tree, that all folks can experience wellness, and that we participate in God's efforts to beat back harm in order to bring in healing. Each act of healing that we perform anticipates and previews God's healing of the nations. I'm walking through here slowly because some of us are, uh, all of us, I'm including myself in this, are troubled by this moment that we experience. The tree is by the throne of God and by the Lamb of God because only God has the authority and the power to heal the nations. But our healing still plays a role. Our healing is a kind of first fruits that whets the appetite for the ultimate healing of the nations that only God can do. What I'm saying is that providing social work anticipates the healing of the nations. Performing nursing and medical services anticipates the healing of the nations. Moving a conversation towards reconciliation and away from mean-spiritedness and sarcasm and cutting folks down just to cope with this moment, that anticipates the healing of the nations. Calling your loved ones, texting your folk to convey concern, that doesn't bring the healing of the nations by itself, but God uses our efforts to anticipate and give people a glimpse that this catastrophe that we're in won't be here always and it anticipates the healing of the nations praying for wellness and working towards it in our own lives is to uh, 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 look forward to and run in advance of in some ways the healing of the nations uh, and as I get ready to to take my seat uh, I just wonder if I can uh, uh, bring along with brother John uh, another visionary uh, but but it, it, it's a visionary uh, who's still with us, uh, a visionary who, who, who had a little song. His name is P.J. Morton. He's the son of, of Bishop Paul Morton, and he has a little song that calls, that goes, uh, everything is going to be all right. Have y'all heard that song? Uh, P.J. Morton has a song, and he, 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 he says that uh, uh, it looks like uh, you don't want me here, but everything's going to be all right. And he, he says, I can hear, uh, I'm riffing on his words, I can hear God's voice loud and clear. Everything's going to be all right. He says, it looks like you want to tear me down, but everything's going to be all right. So let me just stand flat-footed and adjust my crown because everything is going to be all right. 
side. He says two steps forward and ten steps back, but everything is going to be all right. PJ helps us to understand it will be all right. It will be all right. I know we're confused about this moment. I know we're hurt in this moment, but it will be all right. God is still wiping tears. God is still answering prayers. God is still opening doors. God is still making ways out of no ways. It will be all right. Not it might be all right. It will be all right. Hold your head up high. Stick your chest out. It will be all right, dear Christian. Hold your head up high. Run and don't get weary. It will be all right. Trouble doesn't last always. It will be all right. Take courage, dear Christian. Be not dismayed. Be not afraid. God will. God will take care of you. I've heard the lightning flash. I've heard the thunder roll. I felt sin breakers dancing, trying to conquer my soul. But I heard the voice of Jesus say, He promised. He promised. He promised. Never to leave me alone to forsake me if my mother forsakes me if my father forsakes me if the government forsakes me God will God will take me up God will plant my feet on higher ground God is still able don't give in God is still able when you wonder when your next paycheck is have immediate duties and and right now responsibilities but what if we just stood still and trusted that we will see the salvation of the Lord I know this moment is perplexing I know this moment when we're away from the ceremony and away from the the pageantry of church. And I love the pageantry of church. It is God ordained. I have no word to speak against it. I embrace it. But but we're in a moment now where we have to adjust what we understand God's anointing to be. When we call Jesus the Messiah, it means that Jesus is the anointed one. That's, That's what it means literally. And the anointing of Jesus is for the healing of the nations. That's why the Lamb of God is next to a tree whose leaves are meant to literally heal the nations. In the Greek, the word, if we transliterate it into English, it suggests basically therapy. Jesus is a therapy which is complementary to whatever medicine and prescriptions you have, complementary to the therapy on the couch. But there's some things that Jesus touches and mends and heals that nobody else but Jesus can touch. There's some levels of assurance. There, there's a peace be still that we will not experience if we don't come to Christ. That's for real, for real, y'all. And why is it important to put our weight on that point? Because Jesus experienced pain, execution. He was assassinated. Sometimes we we, we, we adorn the language in church, but he, he was assassinated and he was anointed. And yet from Emmanuel's veins, we still find healing for the nations. This is an opportunity for us to have a more comprehensive understanding of what it means to experience personal and public health. 
of what it means for us to appreciate and unapologetically embrace healing for our own flesh but to understand that we are trees in the soil so though this moment may rock us it will not uproot us because we're connected to a river of living water and the leaves y'all which are for the healing of the nations. It's for healing with somebody you haven't talked to in a long time. But now that you got a little more time on your hands, maybe you can reach out to them. The tree is for the healing of the nations, y'all. That's what all, th th this is a picture eschatological. This is what God is up to at the end of the day, y'all. All of what religion is about for Christians is about healing. Healing in Christ. Healing for our communities. Healing for our soul. Healing for our bodies. There may be somebody here that's looking for an opportunity to connect with Christ. We invite you, whether you're streaming with us on Facebook Live or however you may be, immersed in this moment, we invite you to, uh, to, to send us a, a message through Facebook, a direct message. We'll be happy to, to pray with you. Uh, our team, I believe, is, is taking a look at, um, at, at, at Facebook and Instagram so that we can minister to you there. Uh, if you need a time of prayer, uh, also uh, meet us in, in that moment. I'm going to ask the the music ministry to, to come uh, accompany us in song as we extend this, this altar call. And I know I spent a lot of time here, y'all, but uh, this, this, was, this was heavy on my heart. Um, there is, while there are no easy answers to be had in this time, there is nevertheless peace that surpasses all understanding. And that kind of peace can bring us healing, y'all. That's what God has for you. As our music ministry comes to sing, we want you to just contemplate what God is doing in this moment. Hallelujah.